good afternoon or good evening, depending on where you are joining us from. A very warm welcome from myself and my team at DCAF, the Geneva Center for Security Sector Governance, and from our co-host, the Global Alliance of National Human Rights Institutions. As some of you may know, uh, the theme of this year's Geneva Peace Week is Peace is Possible. Given the current geopolitical climate, this might seem like a rather bold statement indeed. However, through this workshop, it is our hope that the, uh, excuse me, through this workshop, it is our hope that the experiences of national human rights institutions in preventing conflict will become more apparent and that by extension, we will come to a better understanding of their crucial role in realizing sustainable development goal 16 and the sustaining peace agenda. Before I continue though, please permit me to make a few technical remarks for our participants. Due to the format of this workshop, participants will remain muted throughout, but we encourage you to keep your cameras on. We also encourage all participants to switch to the speaker view uh, for a better experience. You can do this by clicking view in the top right-hand corner and then select selecting speaker. We also ask you to ensure that your Zoom name reflects how you would like to be addressed. Uh, and we also note that this workshop will only be in English and that it will be recorded, as I just mentioned. If you have any questions for the speakers, we ask you to post these in the chat room, indicating which speaker or speakers they are addressed to. Time permitting, I will select several questions and pose them to the relevant speakers at the end of the workshop. If you have any technical questions or difficulties, we hope you don't, but if you do, please address these to Marta Schwartz using the individual Zoom chat function. Please also note, and this is important, that for simplicity's sake, I will from now on refer to national human rights institutions as NHRIs. Uh, finally, these technical instructions will now be posted in the chat room uh, as well. So with the technical remarks out of the way, I'd like to formally begin the workshop by thanking our co-hosts, the Global Alliance of National Human Rights Institutions for partnering with us today. In the same vein, I would also like to extend my sincere gratitude to the Geneva Peacebuilding Platform and the team at Geneva Peace Week for making this workshop possible. Before I speak a little bit more about the objectives and formats of today's workshop, I'd like to share with you all a warm welcome from the chairperson of Gannery, Miriam Alatia. Uh, due to other commitments, Ms. Alatia could sadly not be with us today, but has been kind enough to record these welcoming, welcoming remarks for us all. Please. أحييكم أطيب تحية. يسعدني ويشرفني أن تواجد معكم هنا اليوم وأن أرحب بكم جميعا أحر ترحيب في ورشة العمل الافتراضية هذه باسم التحالف العالمي للمؤسسات الوطنية لحقوق الإنسان التحالف العالمي للمؤسسات الوطنية لحقوق الإنسان هو الشبكة العالمية للمؤسسات الوطنية لحقوق الإنسان والذي نعمل من خلاله على دعم أعضائنا في جميع أنحاء العالم لتعزيز حقوق الإنسان وحمايتها ويطيب لي أن أستهل كلمتي بتوجه شوافر الشكر لمركز جنيف لحوكمة قطاع الأمن على مبادرته وشراكته في الترويج لهذه الفعالية وإسبوع السلام في جنيف لخلق هذا الحيز الهام للمؤسسات الوطنية لحقوق الإنسان لتقديم مساهمتها الحيوية في الأهداف العالمية ولا سيما الهدف السادس عشر من أهداف التنمية المستدامة الذي يركز على تعزيز المجتمعات السليمة والشاملة التي لا يهمش فيها أحد والوصول إلى العدالة وبناء مؤسسات فعالة وخاضعة للمسائلة وشاملة للجميع كما أود أن أتقدم بعميق شكري وأن أرحب أيضا بزملائنا من المؤسسات الوطنية لحقوق الإنسان الحاضرين معنا هنا اليوم كممثلين لجميع مناطق العالم الذين وافقوا على أن يشاركونا خلال ورشة العمل تجاربهم وخبراتهم الفريدة والشجاعة في البيئات الهشة والمتأثرة بالصراع يضم التحالف اليوم ما يزيد عن 120 مؤسسة وطنية لحقوق الإنسان من جميع أنحاء العالم تم اعتماد 90 مؤسسة منها حاليا كمؤسسات تمتثل بامتثالا تاما لمبادئ باريس وهو الامتثال الذي يحدد معايير استقلالية وفعالية المؤسسات الوطنية لحقوق الإنسان كأحد المؤشرات لقياس تقدم الدول في إطار الهدف السادس عشر تأسيسا على ذلك 
تم وضع المؤسسات الوطنية لحقوق الإنسان بين المؤسسات الرئيسية لإحراز التقدم في جدول أعمال أهداف التنمية المستدامة حيث تلعب دور الجسر الذي يربط بين ركائز الأمم المتحدة الثلاث التنمية والسلام والأمن وحقوق الإنسان أعزائي المشاركين هذا وقت حاسم يتطلب منا أن نجتمع ونناقش دور المؤسسات الوطنية لحقوق الإنسان في إنقاذ وتعزيز أهداف التنمية المستدامة وعلى رأسها الهدف السادس عشر فعلى مدى العقدين الماضيين كانت الأحداث التي شهدها العالم في جميع أصقاعه بمثابة تذكير صارخ لنا جميعا بخطورة قياب سيادة القانون وكيف يمكن أن يؤدي ذلك إلى انتهاكات جسيمة للحقوق المدنية والسياسية والاقتصادية والاجتماعية والثقافية بل ويقود إلى الحكم القمعي ونشوب الصراع علاوة على ذلك فقد ساهمت جائحة كوفيد-19 كما ساهم تأثير تغيير المناخ أيضا في تفاقم عدم المساواة بين السكان المهمشين في جميع أنحاء العالم لقد أصبح التحدي ملحن أكثر من أي وقت مضى وفي جميع أرجاء العالم لبناء مجتمعات تدعم فيها حقوق الإنسان السلوك وتطوير التشريعات والسياسات وصنع القرار في منازلنا ومدارسنا وأماكن عملنا وعبر مجتمعاتنا وللمؤسسات الوطنية لحقوق الإنسان في هذه العملية دور مركزي ومسؤوليات حاسمة ففي العديد من الأماكن وأثناء أوقات النزاع ومواجهة الخطر الحقيقي أظهر أعضاء ومنتسبو المؤسسات الوطنية لحقوق الإنسان في جميع المناطق ما يمكن أن يقدموه من مساهمة في مراقبة التطورات والمستجدات والتحقيق في الانتهاكات وتوثيقها وتحدي السلطة لإحترام حقوق الإنسان في جميع الأوقات وتوفير الحماية للأفراد وإسداء المشورة البناءة والتوجه لمن هم في السلطة إن المؤسسات الوطنية لحقوق الإنسان تتمتع في عقاب النزاعات بوظيفة استثنائية وفريدة في تعزيز الحوار والمقاربات الشاملة للمساعدة في ضمان المساءلة عن انتهاكات حقوق الإنسان السابقة وفي تعزيز الاعتراف بالضحايا كأصحاب حقوق وتعويضهم عما ارتكب في حقهم من انتهاكات سابقة وفي دفع قاطرة الإصلاح المؤسسي اللازم لمعالجة الأسباب الجذرية للنزاع والصراع وقد تواجه المؤسسات الوطنية لحقوق الإنسان نفسها في كثير من الأحيان تحديات إضافية في أوقات النزاع وما بعد النزاع بما في ذلك أعمال الترهيب والانتقام إلى جانب المشاكل الأمنية التي تطول موظفيها وعملياتها ولكل هذه الأسباب فإن فعاليات كفعالية اليوم ضرورية لخلق الوعي بهذا الدور الفريد والقيمة المضافة للمؤسسات الوطنية لحقوق الإنسان لبناء مجتمعات سليمة وفي الختام أتمنى لكم جميعا اجتماعا مثمرا تتبادلون فيه خبراتكم العريضة والمميزة كما أتطلع إلى الاستماع إلى نتائج هذه المناقشات واسمحوا لي مرة أخرى أن أرحب ترحيبا حارا بكم جميعا Thank you so much to uh, Ms. Alatia for these welcoming remarks I, I could see that with the subtitles it may have not been possible for all of us to see them uh, so for those who don't speak Arabic we will uh, share afterwards the recording uh, where you'll be able to see the, the subtitles more clearly um, with that said now allow me to provide a little bit more context on today's workshop before we begin as I'm sure you will know this workshop addresses the contribution of NHRIs to SDG 16 on peace justice and strong institutions and to the sustaining peace agenda adopted in 2015 along with 16 other goals SDG 16 recognizes the importance of peace and security for sustainable development. This is often referred to as the security development nexus and is reflected in the commonly held mantra, sustainable development cannot be realized without peace and security and peace and security will be at risk without sustainable development. To this end, SDG 16 possesses an intrinsic catalytic function as both an outcome and an enabler of the 2030 agenda. It is within this context that my organization, the Geneva Center for Security Sector Governance, currently implements the project linking good security sector governance to SDG 16. The project is based on our conviction that a transparent and accountable security sector is a key enabler of peace and by extension, sustainable development. I know that this, this view is of course shared by our co-host as well, Ganry. 
Our project here at DCAF is implemented through three activity lines, high level policy events, such as this one today, which seek to position security sector reform as a policy tool for realizing SDG 16, the development of knowledge products research, which seek to capture the contribution of security sector oversight actors, such as NHRIs to SDG 16, and capacity building activities, which aim to equip security sector oversight actors with the knowledge and expertise necessary to contribute to SDG 16. It is under this project that today's workshop was conceived. Both DCAF and Gannery view NHRIs as vitally important for holding security actors, such as police or armed forces, to account. NHRIs do this through monitoring human rights abuses, mediating between the state and society, and providing access to justice through receiving and handling complaints. As such, NHRIs act as a bridge between state and society, and as societal thermometers, able to detect and address grievances before they escalate into conflict. In this sense, NHRIs directly contribute to many of the targets under SDG 16, including SDG 16 target 16.1 on reducing armed violence, 16.3 on improving access to justice, and 16.6 on accountable, effective, and transparent institutions. They also simultaneously contribute to the sustaining peace agenda by addressing the inequalities and injustices that often drive conflict cycles. Indeed, the contribution of NHRIs to preventing conflict will be illustrated during this work workshop through the sharing of practices, experiences, and stories from several NHRIs. These include from Dr. Catalina Crespo Sancho, the current National Ombudsperson of Costa Rica, Attorney General and Andrew Cruz de Goya, uh, Executive Director of the Commission on Human Rights of the Philippines, Dr. Mary Kolekmashvili, uh, I hope I got that correct, Senior Advisor to the Public Defender of Georgia, and finally, Lucas Kimanthi, Assistant Director in the Reforms and Accountability Division at the Kenyan National Commission of Human Rights. A huge thank you to all our speakers who have taken the time to be here today. So I've already spoken far too much. Uh, so allow me to conclude my opening remarks with a short poll. So on your screen now, you should see a poll, which should pop up. And this poll asks the question, have any of you ever worked with or for national human rights institutions on Sustainable Development Goal 16 and or the Sustainable Peace Agenda. So I'll give you all some time. Please select yes or no, depending on whether you have. I see the votes are being tallied. Okay, I think we are. So 41% have participated. So for those who haven't, I encourage you to select one of the choices. So if your answer is yes, we encourage you to share your experiences by writing down in the chat room, your name, affiliation, and a description in just two or three sentences of your contribution to SDG 16 or the Sustaining Peace Agenda through your work with or for NHRIs. Some of these stories will be selected and shared with the audience towards the end of the workshop. For those of you who answered no, and I can see quite a few did, not to worry, that is the point of today's event. So hopefully through this workshop, you will discover the unique role played by NHRIs in contributing towards SDG 16 and the Sustaining Peace Agenda. So I think most of us have now answered the poll. So I will now then conclude that poll, if we, fantastic. And now allow me to please introduce our first speaker. Dr. Catalina Crespo Sancho has been the National Ombudsperson of Costa Rica since 2018, and was the president of the Central American and Caribbean Council for National Institutions of Human Rights. She is a human rights specialist with over 15 years experience in international development, working for the World Bank, the Inter-American Development Bank, 
and as an advisor for governments, including Costa Rica and Madagascar. As an academic, Dr. Sancho was a professor at Teachers College Columbia University and at the University of Georgia. She holds a PhD in sociology of education from the State University of New York at Buffalo. Dr. Sancho, thank you so much for being with us. The floor is yours. Greetings, everyone. Um, this the session, I, I organized it in such a way that it could be a workshop for everyone that they can take, either if you're from an NHRI or an NGO or even government or private sector. So keep that in mind that this will be uh, helpful for everyone. So basically um, what you wanna do is, is most of the NHRIs, including uh, also NGOs and many of you, it, it work in a more reactive way. But there's also a wor uh, work that could be in a prevention way, which is not the norm, but we should be moving, uh, you know, the world in general towards that end. So the more reactive way that NHRIs work is, uh, at least in Costa Rica, is we work on individual complaints and we resolve them. And then, um, but those individual complaints will tell us what's going on in order to make structural ch changes. So uh, the prevention framework that we used in Costa Rica was based on the Pathways for Peace, um, Inclusive Approaches to Preventing Violent Conflict. And that it, framework, we adapted it to our, our work here in Costa Rica. So what we did was first we looked into a four year strategy because that's the elected position term. And we looked into how we can base it on prevention. Uh, the second one, in order to do this, we looked at how uh, we can develop, and we did develop a data agenda of all our work in order to understand what the problems were, who the people, and, and the rest, of, for example, here at age, location, schooling, socioeconomic background. The third was to develop a typology. It, NHRIs, one of the things is to that we could do is to classify complaints. For example, what is the, um, the human right uh, abuse that, that the complaint is, is, is talking about and how you can classify it. And the last one, that, that the last point that we used in order to, to make this uh, strong prevention framework is to use SDGs and the 2030 agenda as a strategy framework. But let me tell you how we did this. Okay, the first, the first one that we talked about. So how do we get a strategy based on prevention? So this is the case specifically for our institution. Of course, uh, everyone has different, different topics. For, but for our institution, we looked at uh, three different uh, topics that were, you know, like overarching. With all the data, we found that uh, making stronger institutions was, was uh, very, very uh, important. Um, oh, sorry. Let me see if you can. Let me see it for the, sorry about that. I'm not, they're telling me that I'm not. Uh, um, Just to share your, your presentation. There, with, yes. Yeah, I'm so sorry. No, no problem. Let me see. Okay, sorry about that. Can you see it now? Yep, and then maybe just go yes, to the sorry, full sorry, I was looking at it myself. Please excuse no, no. me. The just other ones the... weren't that important, but this one, this one, this one is. Maybe just go so. to the full screen um, option if you can. There we go. Yeah, perfect. Okay, please excuse me. So um, as you can see, one of the issues that, uh, that, Sex, so I can stay okay. So um, here is so we we found three areas uh, of related to um, to prevention, stronger institutions in our, in our country, Costa Rica, poverty and inequality, and in the issue of polarization and exclusion. So we organized all our work 
based on these three. Of course, then institutions, we looked at the ones that were the most complaints about poverty and inequality. What are the, the, the issues that we can prevent? So for example, rural areas is a big thing here in, in, in Latin America in general, and I think in most of the world, that there's a big exclusion, which also relates to uh, number three, the, the third point. Then the second point that's related to uh, the data agenda, how do you get strong data in order to make decisions, in order to understand what's going on in your country or in your area of work, you need strong data. For our specific, and this is where um, the, the thermometer thing goes, because NHRIs, as Richard said at the introduction, we are considered like thermometers. We, uh, these institutions actually know what's happening even before the government knows what's happening. So that's why it, it's, they're so important to democracy and to prevention. So here, uh, I could, we could see from the data who's coming, which are mainly women, almost 60%. Uh, we can see uh, who are they, you know, what's their background. They're mostly, interestingly enough, not a lot of young people, 35 to 54 are the ones who put complaints and they're coming from marginal urban and rural areas and with high school or less. So that Those are the people. And then uh, uh, I put a little map here. And as you can see, 31%, which the majority of are coming from like the main, um, like the capital area. So that's important. The, this is this information is important to to make decisions. Also, you need to understand what's happening at the forecasting. This is in Spanish. However, basically what what it says is that one of the biggest issues that we're going to have is uh, uh, that Costa Rica is a middle income country, is uh, still a developing country, what, but with developing issues such as the majority of the population is uh, getting older. So we need to prepare for that. So one of the things that we said, okay, prevention, we have to concentrate the institutional data and the national data are telling us these two things. Women in poverty, one thing, and the elderly is another thing that we need to concentrate on. This is what the, the, the data is telling us. And then we need to do structural research in order to do prevention in these two topics. So for example, women in poverty, productive employment and re the things related to banking and the elderly, basically the number one thing is pensions because the country will not have enough money for pensions. So what was the third step? The typology, how do you classify complaints? So for example, we said, okay, what are the main complaints? A right, uh, the right to access to health. And then what are, uh, how did we even desegregate that into like, what are the complaints that we're getting? And then also the efficiency in public services. And mainly there were access to, to water, uh, unjustified delay or refusal of, of, of things that people were asking. So those that information also helped to build the framework. And then the use the, the, we use the SDGs and the 2030 agenda as a strategy framework. But here we used uh, SDG 16 as an important framework. And I do want to recognize that we use the Pathfinders um, from a New York University as a framework that you could use for your work. So please look into that one. So this is the framework that we used, and this is how we adapted it into our work. So you can have that too, that presentation. So we looked at what is related to peaceful societies in our work. So for example, safe migration, as you all know, the issues of Venezuelan migration is, is going on in, in Central America specifically. So that's a big, uh, a big point. And then just society, we all, all this was organized into our work. What is it that we're doing and how is it that uh, we can use that as a prevention? But also one of the other important things is that not only to stay in that, but how can you expand the work? It, it, specifically, for example, uh, Costa Rica uh, last year became part of the OECD. So 
This is the new report, the annual report of how we organized all our work, which also helps to get funding. So that's something important for all of you who are out there. If you get this information and organize it in this way, it also helps to get funding. So we did the sustainable development goals, SDG 16, and we organized all our work there. But we also included, because of Costa Rica specific, um, you know, just uh, it being part of OECD, we put how we are uh, getting to OECD uh, requirements or not. So we organized that um, in order to, to get to SDGs, we're pretty far behind, especially after COVID. So all that information is in our report. And in order to, um, now that we're part of OECD, uh, now we're in one of the last ones uh, on, on the last, um, um, you know, kind of, before Costa Rica was this great country in Central America, and now we're part of the OECD, and now, so we're one of the last ones. So that helps funders, and that helps um, it, for you as institutions, NGOs, or to get funding also. So um, I hope this was very helpful. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Dr. Sancho, for your insightful presentation, which I think, uh, I mean, there's, there's much to take uh, from the presentation, including, as you say, some of the opportunities that aligning your work with SDG 16 has provided. Um, but also, I think your presentation really underscores the critical role played by NHRIs in addressing grievances. Uh, particularly through your monitoring work and your complaints handling. Um, I, this idea that, you, that you've done at your office of disaggregating data, developing a, a typology for classifying complaints, and then proposing corrective policy actions. Um, I think this is you know, a really illustrative example of how NHRIs can act as this bridge between the state and society. So I would also say to our participants from around the world, uh, if you have any questions for Dr. Sancho, I really encourage you to, to post them in the chat room uh, and I will do my utmost to make sure we answer them towards the end of the workshop. So with that said, uh, allow me to please introduce our next speaker, uh, Attorney uh, de Gia. Uh, Attorney Gia is the Executive Director of the Commission on Human Rights of the Philippines. As the spokesperson of the Commission since 2016, she has placed great emphasis on addressing human rights issues across the Philippines. Prior to this, she held the post of Director of the Public Affairs and Strategic Communications Office. And in parallel to her current role as the Executive Director of the Commission on Human Rights, she continues as well to head the Strategic Communications Division and Citizens Health and Action Division. Prior to this, she was also the regional director of the Southern Talalog uh, for six years and was formerly a professor of law. So we're really honored to have you here today. Uh, Attorney Gia, the, the floor is yours, please. Thank you, uh, Richard, and uh, good evening, everyone, to uh, my partners and friends in the human rights community. Today, I will talk about uh, the role of the CHRP as a national human rights institution in the protection of human rights under international humanitarian law. Let me begin by saying that the Philippines has experienced armed conflict for centuries, particularly in southern Philippines, where Moros and indigenous peoples, or ITs, have waged a struggle against Spanish and American colonizers. In the recent decades, beginning in the 1960s, communist insurgency movements have clashed with the state forces. Aside from these armed conflicts, including armed engagements, uh, clan feuding and low intensity conflicts, including armed engagements with paramilitary groups have been occurring in rural areas of the country. As armed conflicts occur, Human rights issues also surface in this context. Militarization in communities has been rampant, with both state and non-state armed groups setting up camps in civilian settlements, including schools. Red tagging, or the practice of accusing dissidents of being involved in communist insurgency, has been practiced by state actors as well as trolls in social media. Communities in armed conflict areas also experience difficulties in accessing basic services due to an insecure environment 
and lack of development programs in these places. The Internal Displacement Monitoring Center, or the IDMC, has reported that between 2008 and 2021, more than 3 million persons have been displaced by armed conflict in the Philippines, majority of which were in Mindanao, in the southern part of the country. In 2021 alone, 108,463 persons were displaced by armed conflict. The CHR has established a dedicated center known as the Crisis, Conflict, and Humanitarian Center in 2016 to cater to IHL violations as a result of conflict and the displacement it results to. And this year, we have also tapped our analysis unit to look into IHL cases, which aims to look at the macro perspective to establish trends and patterns from the cases that we have received from the AFP or the military over the past few years, aside from the conduct of individual case investigations. Our regional offices, through our special investigators, conduct independent investigations pertaining to human rights violations allegedly committed by state agents or the security sector. Our investigations are green code. We want to make sure that there is accountability in case that it is backed up by evidence. But more importantly, we would also like to make sure that we are able to identify policy recommendations for the government so that um, these violations will be avoided in the future. If we were to look into the international humanitarian law, the CHRP is identified by law to provide services in relation to the investigation of IHL cases and to support advocacy activities in promoting IHL. And that is the reason why the Commission over the past few years have endeavored to identify or designate special investigators within the central office as well as the regional offices to look into violations of IHL and uh, for them to ensure that there is a conduct of investigation where warranted and to popularize and deepen the understanding about the IHL. If we were to look at the relationship of the CHRT and the security sector under slide 12, the CHRT and the security sector has enjoyed regular en uh, engagements through the years except with the police during the previous administration in relation to its war on drugs. It thus coordinates uh, in the investigation of cases, and we also engage with the security sector with regards promotion activities as well as educational activities. In fact, over the years, we have developed a graduated curricula for the military, police, prosecution, correction officers, and local government units, which is found uh, in slide 13. The CHRP and the AFP, or the military, have worked together in crafting the Human Rights International Humanitarian Law Training Course of the Armed Forces, which all of the AFP recruits have to take to complete their enlistment. The Commission also assisted the Philippine Military Academy in the review of their program of instructions on human rights. The commission as well also assists the military in the inclusion of economic, social, and cultural rights in their curriculum. We also recall that during the fourth commission, we did enter into the La Presa Declaration on Human Rights Cooperation. It is a cooperation agreement between the CHRP the major services of the armed forces of the Philippines, as well as the Philippine National Police, aiming to open dialogue for improvement of policy and practice on human rights in the security sector, which is to abide by human rights laws and standards, including the international humanitarian law. Recently, during the Fifth Commission, we have made sure that we entered into a data sharing agreement with the AFP as well as a memorandum of understanding. We signed a data sharing agreement to enable speedy and comprehensive investigation of alleged human rights violations or abuses 
and violations against IHL involving members of the armed forces of the Philippines. The ceremonial signing of the said agreement was held last May 4, 2022. The said agreement is part of the Memorandum of Understanding signed between the CHR and the AFP in March 12, 2021, which outlines both parties' mutual commitment of strengthening education and training as one output, second, information sharing and referral of cases in pursuit of accountability, as well as improved monitoring and reporting of incidents. We have also endeavored through the said MOU to facilitate the speedy release of clearances, which I will be speaking about later. We also made sure that in recent years, we have strengthened our participation in the IHL Ad Hoc Committee. The IHL Ad Hoc Committee was created by Executive Order 134, Series of 1999. It commemorates International Humanitarian Law Day every 12th day of August to raise popular awareness on IHL and to reiterate the state's responsibility to apply IHL rules in the conduct of armed conflict in and out of the country. The CHRP is a member of the committee, providing on-the-ground information on IHL issues as well as engage security sector and government agencies on IHL advocacies. Apart from the participation in the IHL ad hoc committee, we also issue several press statements urging the government to pursue peace, to make sure that it is able to respect the rights of the people on the ground, while making sure that our security sector abide by the rule of law and to make sure that displacement as a result of conflict is addressed by different government agencies. We have also made sure that we have uh, established a clearance process for our security sector as mandated by our omnibus rules on human rights in investigations, the CHRP conducts clearance processes for all members of the major services of the security sector seeking promotion, retirement, or schooling training abroad. Usually, those who are sent on UN peacekeeping missions apply for clearances from the commission, making sure that they are not involved in alleged or establish human rights violations. In cases where members of the security sector have been asserted to have taken part in a human rights violation, we do issue a certification instead. The clearance states that these military and police personnel have no pending human rights cases in the commission and therefore are recommended either for promotion, retirement, or schooling or training abroad, including, of course, their services under the UN peacekeeping mission. We have also made sure that we are able to monitor the human rights compliance of the security sector in pursuit of our investigation mandate. Over the past uh, year, we have noted that uh, there are actually 41 pending cases uh, involving the Philippine Army and 277 from the Philippine National Police. We'd, uh, I'd also like to mention uh, something which is not reflected in our slides. Uh, this data pertains to our database, whereas we have recently received from uh, the military through its AFP Center for Law uh, and Armed Conflict, at least a total number of 1,700 cases, which they have filed before the Commission on Human Rights, which they say are, uh, are alleged human rights violations committed by non-state actors, which uh, the Commission is looking into. Uh, I'd also like to mention that uh, in relation to the conduct of our investigation, we have also over the past few years conducted several public inquiries and one in connection with the security sector was uh, the public inquiry on human rights defenders. It looked into the possible violations committed by the security sector 
uh, against uh, human rights defenders, which would also include red tagging. The CHRT is also the facilitator between communities and the security sector. By engaging the security sector in the conduct of human rights-based approach to peace and order implementation, the Commission improves its monitoring mechanisms through easier access to military camps as well as institutions. We also make sure that engagements with the security sector improve the security of CHR investigations during monitoring activities in conflict and disaster areas. Say, for example, we we'll, uh, we'll enlist the assistance of the AMP in providing covert security to investigators in high-risk areas, as well as tap on their intelligence and security protocols during monitoring missions. We'd also like to highlight that uh, in furtherance of the CHRP's role as facilitator between communities and the security sector, we have also institutionalized the conduct of community-based dialogues. Through the community-based dialogues, the CHRP brings together different stakeholders, such as government agencies, the security sector, and concerned civil society organizations or local communities to address key human rights issues on the ground. We act as a bridge between these two parties and make sure that uh, there is a safe space provided for them, a uh, dialogue facilitated by the CHR, which would uh, put uh, their respective uh, issues uh, on the floor so that such may be taken up and addressed. We'd also like to highlight that the CHRP has participated in many regional peace and order councils at the local level, which helps communities' voices be heard in the security sector platforms. Notably, the CHRP has contributed to the development of a handbook on handling internal displacement, including in conflict settings, which was published by the RTOC of Caraga, one region in the Philippines. The Commission provided a human rights-based approach in looking into displacement concerns that the RPOC Caraga took into consideration in addressing and handling displacements in the region. I'd also like to mention that through our centers, we have conducted monitoring missions to monitor uh, incidents of displacement brought about by conflict, especially in the southern part of the Philippines. There were many challenges that we have encountered throughout the years in the conduct of our work with regards to the uh, security sector. One would be the effect on the perception of the independence as well as the neutrality of the CHRP. Uh, in recent years, uh, the government has been very hostile to the CHRP, and this has translated also to difficulties, most especially at the national level, in terms of engaging in, uh, in areas of cooperation with the police. But we do note that with the military, through its AFP's uh, Center for Law and Armed Conflict, they have made sure, uh, together with the CHRP, to continuously engage, and monthly meetings have been done uh, on a regular basis so that we are able to discuss uh, areas of cooperation. And then, of course, another continuing uh, challenge is the change in command or even in administration, which would also translate into changes in the already established dynamics between the CHRP and the security sector. Uh, we do note that uh, the relationship has improved uh, during this administration, but during the previous administration, to a lot of extent, especially with the police, such as with stream, but as I mentioned a while ago with the military, there has been continuous engagement. Moving forward, uh, we would like to make sure that uh, we are able to recommend uh, effective measures, which will make sure that uh, we are able to contribute to SDG 16 in our role as an NHRI. Uh, one is to continue to urge government to pursue the peace process. 
Uh, number two is the continued engagement with the security sector, particularly in mainstreaming human rights-based approach within their ranks, which would also entail the implementation of the graduated human rights IHL curricula that is used not only during recruitment of personnel, but also during the assignment as well as promotion. And also sustaining the engagement with battalion level human rights offices of the military. We would like to also make sure that we are able to continue facilitating civil society partnerships with the security sector, because we do believe that the civil society can help improve the military's accountability mechanisms with local communities. In particular, here in the Philippines, we would like to make sure that we are able to pursue the full implementation of the United Nations Joint Program, which also highlights accountability as well as redress mechanisms through the AO35, uh, as well as other uh, outcomes. We would also like to make sure that we are able to continuously advocate for passage of laws, which will promote uh, the rights of uh, persons in relation to conflict. Uh, in particular, we would like to make sure that the IDP or the internally displaced persons uh, law will be passed uh, that will uh, ensure greater protection to those that are displaced as a result of conflict. We also would like to make sure that the Human Rights Defenders Bill is passed into legislation, which will also protect uh, human rights defenders involved in this work, uh, especially uh, with the enactment of the anti-terror law, which causes a lot of confusion also uh, with regards to the international humanitarian law. And of course, we'd also like to make sure that we are able to support the modernization of the security sector because we believe that the highly professionalized police and military will be ultimately human rights-based compliant in the end. It has been a pleasure uh, joining tonight, uh, everyone tonight, and sharing our insights on how and NHRI can contribute in terms of IHL implementation. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Atani. Yeah, it's a real pleasure to have you joining from, from Manila. Um, and I uh, particularly was interested in some of the challenges that, that you faced in, in your preventative work. And I hope that we can come to some of those challenges, discuss them further during the, the Q&A. Um, but I just wanna make one very quick you know, remark. And, and I would say through, through all your work on monitoring and investigating human rights abuses, your training and sensitization of security actors on human rights, uh, and your mediation role that we've spoke a lot about already, this mediation role between state and society and between different armed groups. I think these are really uh, perfect examples of the type of work that NHRIs can do to prevent, manage, and resolve conflict. So thank you so much for sharing your stories and your strategies you've used with us. Now, in the interest of time, I think we're running slightly behind time. Um, so I'm going to move a little bit more quickly now. Um, so allow me now to introduce uh, our third speaker, uh, Dr. Mary Kok Lamashvili, and I hope I got that uh, correct, Gamajova. Um, so let me just briefly introduce uh, Mary Gamajova. So since 2010, uh, Mary has held the post of Senior Advisor within the Office of the Georgian Public Defender, <clears throat> where she focuses on human rights issues among conflict-affected populations. Um, I will, in the interest of time, I will not finish your bio purely because I know you will reflect on much of the work you've done during your, your presentation. So please, without further ado, I hand the floor to you. Thank you. Uh, thank you again. And first of all, really let me express my gratitude that I have a chance to and opportunity to talk today about national human rights institutions and uh, their role in this regard. So I represent national human rights institution uh, in Georgian case, this is called the Office of Public Defender. Uh, and I think that we have all national human rights institutions have a unique uh, mandate uh, to monitor, promote and protect uh, human, uh, human rights issues. And uh, we are uniquely positioned as you already mentioned and we can uh, play a bridge uh, and uniquely uh, positioned between the state institutions, societal uh, groups, 
uh, at national, regional, and international level. So uh, the broad mandate uh, gives us opportunity uh, and enables us to consider human rights violation in a comprehensive way and remain impartial, um, uh, impartial and propose holistic solutions uh, based on human rights standards. So. My dear colleagues, I think that I won't be the first one who will say that uh, the best way to deal with uh, the conflict is to prevent it. And I see um, our institutions, national human rights institutions, uh, can play a key and crucial role uh, in this way because we have a power and mandate to push um, and to, how to say, to underline all systematic gaps that uh, people um, who are are conflict affected, uh, they are facing their uh, these issues uh, in their everyday life. Um, so uh, monitoring, promoting and uh, protecting the human rights of conflict affected population uh, definitely is uh, one of the particular importance for my office. And as you are aware, uh, in my country and in my country's context, so uh, the war first happened in 19, uh, 1990s. And after that, unfortunately, more than half a million people uh, affected, uh, after, uh, affected from these conflicts. And uh, the whole population is maximum 4 uh, million. So you can imagine uh, how many people were um, um, affected by conflict after this war. So um, despite the fact that uh, in my country nowadays uh, there is no ongoing military uh, confrontations, still people who are um, uh, conflict affected um, are um, facing uh, consequences of, our, of this war. Um, and uh, regarding my office work in this field, um, I would like to underline some important issues. So our work regarding the protection and promoting um, of, uh, human rights uh, situation of conflict affected population implies uh, several uh, important directions. First of all, it is monitoring the human rights situation of conflict affected population. Uh, and uh, also I would like to mention that uh, our office is dealing with the uh, people who are residing uh, still in occupied regions, people who are residing uh, close uh, villages near administrative boundary lines, and people who are um, holding the status of internal displaced persons. So these three groups, despite the fact that they are a conflict affected population, they are having different challenges. Uh, and uh, thus also we are having different challenges uh, to, um, uh, to uh, help them and to promote their human rights. So um, our uh, work in this uh, regard implies, as I said, monitoring, uh, also dealing with individual cases, which is also very important, drafting uh, annual parliamentary reports as well as special reports, cooperation with uh, international, local and regional organizations, and of course, with governmental institutions, uh, also carrying out educational activities. And in, uh, we are um, strongly engaged in confidence building um, uh, projects and also um, participation in different governmental um, uh, commissions, working groups, uh, and various um, uh, groups that are dealing with policy of um, uh, conflict-affected populations. But today I would like to uh, more uh, talk about monitoring, um, uh, monitoring tools, uh, how we do it, uh, what we are doing in this way. So um, as I already mentioned, we have uh, three um, uh, types of conflict affected populations. So um, ma the two regions, Abkhazia and South Ossetia, um, are breakaway regions which are occupied by Russia. And unfortunately, we don't have any access there and we don't uh, exercise their effective control, unfortunately. Uh, so uh, as uh, I told you, uh, we are still despite the fact that we have uh, um, we have no direct access and presence in Abkhazia and South Ossetia. However, we are still trying to monitor the human rights situation on the ground. I mean, what's happening uh, in Abkhazia and South Ossetia, because still our citizens are, um, um, are continuing their uh, 
uh, to live, and they are facing a lot of challenges. Um, and uh, uh, as we don't have any access there and we can't have uh, direct information from the field, we in this way uh, see uh, local um, NGOs and international organizations as our partners, because um, uh, if you don't have close cooperation with these uh, organizations, you can't have any information what's going on, because there are very few um, NGOs and international organizations who have access um, uh, on those territories. So in this way, in this uh, field, I mean, people who are residing in occupied regions, uh, monitoring, we are doing like this. But now I would also um, pay your attention how we are doing monitoring where we have direct access. And uh, these are people who are living uh, near the villages uh, of um, administrative boundary lines. So these villages are under our control, fortunately, um, but they are living so close to these administrative boundary uh, lines that uh, they are um, affected by this conflict because it's ongoing occupation still because the Russian Federation are doing these artificial fences. Uh, and so it's almost every day they are still doing this, um, uh, this uh, kind of issues. So um, me in person is almost every month going to these villages and speaking to the people in person. And uh, this monitoring itself means that you are not only talking to the people who are uh, themselves uh, conflict affected, but uh, you are giving them legal consultation, so-called, because they have a lot of questions and unfortunately not all of them have access to uh, information. So this is a um, kind of unique way to to go there and give them um, comprehensive information about their human rights. Um, and also uh, this monitoring uh, visits helps um, uh, you to see the systematic gaps uh, and the problems that they have. And uh, from that uh, field uh, visit, you can take some cases and study uh, these cases because I told you that we are dealing with individual cases and this individual cases itself does not mean that um, um, only they should address our office. It means that you can do it on your own initiative. So it's our mandate as well. So um, you know, this kind of monitoring I do almost every month. And also um, I'm monitoring uh, the situation of internal displaced persons who are living um, in various places uh, throughout the uh, country. Um, these people are more than 7% of the whole society, as I uh, told you already, uh, and as I mentioned already, as internal displaced uh, people, IDPs, um, are having a lot of problems. You know that durable housing solution is uh, the most important issue for them. So housing issues, social economic issues. So this monitoring helps you to see not only social economic uh, conditions, how they are living and what kind of living space they have, but you also um, find out there what kind of needs they have, what kind of livelihood projects they need, to, because not only house is the durable solution, but also they need some income uh, projects. So uh, yeah, also, um, so as I told, one group is people who are residing in um, villages near ABL and uh, IDPs who are living in a various settlements because after the war from 90s, 1990s, uh, they were uh, forced to leave their houses and to move to another part of the country. Uh, unfortunately, um, uh, as uh, I already mentioned, I can't do monitoring myself in Abkhazia and South Society, but I have a lot of information what's going on there, and uh, I would like to underline some uh, most challenging issue what people are um, having there. So freedom of movement uh, is the first and the most important issue for them because um, de facto authorities are imposing a lot of um, artificial 
barriers so they can't cross this checkpoint and come to our control territory to get better uh, medical treatment, to get better education. So this is a um, really challenging issue. So in, uh, in this way, we are trying to use our mandate and to push government to do something and to use all international mechanisms in order to, uh, to uh, soften their everyday life. Um, the second issue of uh, our work, uh, I would like to underline uh, policy level, what we are doing on a policy level. Uh, so as I mentioned, participate, participation in different commissions and uh, uh, working groups, uh, what does it mean? For example, the first law on IDPs in Georgia was in 1996, which completely did not um, answer to international standards. So uh, in 2014, uh, Public Defender's Office uh, uh, um, made a um, working group where we drafted the new law on IDPs. So um, what I want to say is that our mandate, national human rights institutions can um, use their mandate as a, a pushing mechanism, government, to say that this is a problem and it should be done like this or like that. So um, uh, we are um, very actively involved in policy making level and also all the state strategies on IDPs and conflict affected populations. Um, so this is briefly what I wanted to mention, the monitoring and participation on policy level. And uh, if you uh, would have any um, other issues and questions, of course, I'm ready to answer because we have uh, time. Um, so I, I need to, yeah, thank you. Thank you so much, Mary. Thank you so much. And just to say, I know that there's so much rich work that you've done and that your office continues to do. Um, and we will, following this event, uh, compile a report uh, together with our speakers um, to reflect on some of this work and we'll disseminate it to all of you here. So I know, you know, the purpose of today is really to hear stories about practical work, but I understand there's a, there's a lot of richness here. Um, so yes, thank you so much um, for, your, for your intervention. And I particularly also, noted the really successful work that your office has done on lobbying for amendments to legislation on IDPs. And I think this, this policy work is really important because you know the question I've always had is, is how does the data collection and, and analysis done by your offices here, how does that translate to actual policy change? And I think you gave a really good example of in practice how that does. Um, so I won't speak anymore um, in the interest of time. Uh, and I'd now like to hand over to our final speaker, last but not least, uh, Mr. Lucas uh, Kim Kimanti. I hope I pronounced that correctly. Uh, so Mr. Kimanti is the Assistant Director uh, in the Reforms and Accountability Division at the Kenyan National Commission on Human Rights and the focal point on elections and electoral accountability. Um, I, I really look forward to your intervention and I know you'll be focusing on, on the work of you and, and your office in uh, monitoring election cycles uh, and trying to prevent electoral violence. Uh, so over to you, uh, please, the floor is yours. Uh, uh, thank you uh, very much. Uh, first, I want to appreciate uh, for this uh, great opportunity uh, to speak uh, in this uh, forum. Um, my presentation is around uh, monitoring of uh, elections in the context of Kenya and um, the impact on uh, stability and uh, the impact on uh, enjoyment of um, uh, human rights. So uh, I want to begin by saying that uh, elections in Kenya presents a very big deal for all of us as Kenyans. Um, and the history goes back to the 70s when we had the first referendum, uh, which led to a bit of uh, instability and displacement of people, a lot of killings, uh, especially uh, members of the Somali uh, community. Uh, fast forward uh, 2002, we also had a very uh, bad experience as a country. Uh, because uh, many people within the central um, and upper central part of the country, uh, many uh, people lost their lives, uh, many more uh, were displaced. But the worst that we've seen uh, in this country in terms of um, breach of peace, instability, uh, gross violation of human rights 
was 2007, when uh, around um, whatever, what, what has been documented is around uh, 1,300 people uh, lost their lives. Uh, many more thousands were displaced. Uh, many more lost um, uh, their property and many more uh, were displaced. Again, also in 2017, we also had a, a similar uh, scenario. Again, uh, you know, killings, um, issues to do with displacement, issues to do with um, uh, sexual violence uh, and, 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 you know, such uh, uh, atrocities. Um, and the background to this is because uh, the way we operate uh, in this country is that um, we put a lot of uh, very high premium in terms of um, certain positions, uh, one starting with the, uh, the seats uh, of the, 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 the president, that uh, many Kenyans would do whatever it takes to ensure that the person who would take that seat um, you know, should uh, come from their um, community or they should have some affiliation of some sort. Uh, and that creates, you know, that uh, scenario where you, you, you find a, uh, an enmity crops up uh, or an election cycle is five years. Um, you find that uh, probably the uh, first four years we are, we, 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 we are okay, we, 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 we cooperate uh, properly as, 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 as citizens of this country, but towards the end of the fourth year and the fifth year, the electoral uh, year, uh, a lot of uh, instability uh, again um, uh, crops up. Um, again, just to demonstrate how uh, elections have uh, impacted uh, in terms of instability, in terms of human rights violations in this country, is uh, again, what happened uh, in 2007, um, many, many people lost their lives. And um, for the first time in the history of this country, because of the serious nature of uh, the violations that occurred at that point, we had uh, our former president uh, and his deputy, uh, who is now the current uh, president, uh, being taken to the ICC at The Hague. And you know, that demonstrates how um, uh, elections uh, you know, is a big deal uh, uh, in this um, uh, country. And therefore, uh, also, what also contributes to this is uh, the issue of um, unresolved uh, grievances, um, past violations, um, which have you know, not been addressed. Again, also the issue of um, uh, impunity that uh, for quite some time, uh, because of the past regimes, people would commit uh, serious crimes within the electoral cycle and they would not be taken to account. And therefore, you know, it uh, brought a situation where people uh, would, not, would feel that whenever we're having elections or, you know, uh, the fifth year, you know, people can, you know, disregard the rule of law. Uh, people can kill, people can do all the nasty things uh, that uh, you can imagine. And again, uh, because um, also during the electoral uh, year, uh, also, other you know people, other persons take advantage of uh, the situation because at that point, uh, when we are having uh, or when we are nearing uh, elections as a, as a country, it's, it's like we almost drop everything else and uh, you know we just concentrate uh, on elections and people take advantage of that. Uh, we have cases of uh, Castro, uh, Castro rustling. Sorry, um, that's the time when uh, also criminals take advantage uh, and so on and so forth. Um, and therefore, um, just to uh, summarize what I've said, that elections then in Kenya create, and in the past, uh, has created a situation where there will be in, uh, instability and there will be uh, a breach of, uh, of peace. And that, again, would have a direct impact uh, on uh, the enjoyment of, um, of human rights. And that's the reason why the Kenya National Commission on Human Rights uh, as a very keen interest uh, in terms of uh, monitoring uh, elections. So I just want to give, uh, uh, again, um, the um, scenarios from the Kenya National Commission on Human Rights, how we've been doing this. Uh, that one, um, we are very keen on issues to do with data and information. 
And uh, just to demonstrate this, um, uh, two days before, we had um, the commission uh, uh, through a chairperson uh, launching uh, a project on S, uh, SDG 16, uh, 1.0, on issues to do with uh, information and access uh, um, to information. So uh, the first thing that we do uh, when we are designing a project to monitor elections is, uh, you know, to create uh, tools which would help us, you know, capture uh, the information. The other thing that we also do is uh, uh, what we call hotspots mapping, that uh, we also look at um, uh, parts of the country where, uh, based on um, a number of factors, that we anticipate that there will be a breach of peace, there will be human rights violations, and, you know, we concentrate uh, on that. And then the other thing is, of course, because of um, boosting, uh, you know, the numbers uh, that we also um, hire, uh, train, and uh, deploy uh, field uh, monitors. The other important thing that I would want to mention is that um, as the Kenya National Commission on Human Rights, one of the things that um, is the head of uh, uh, elections monitoring that I'm very uh, happy about is that uh, we have um, an internal uh, digital uh, uh, platform, which now helps us, you know, capture the information uh, from uh, our members of staff across the five regional offices, and also the monitors who we train and and deploy. And what happens is that um, this uh, platform then becomes like our early warning, uh, you know, system that we are able to see um, on real time that. Uh, this part of the country or this other part of the country, uh, this breach of peace, there are violations, and therefore then at that point we are able now uh, as a commission um, to concentrate on those areas and uh, address uh, certain uh, you, you know issues as, as, as we get them. Um, the other thing uh, that once we capture all this information, the other thing that uh, we normally do is of course to do a lot of uh, uh, background check, uh, a lot of analysis. And then uh, once that is done, then um, we are able to escalate this uh, to the management and uh, specifically our um, chairperson and the commissioners. And therefore then now, once we are satisfied that the information that uh, we're having and it is uh, with, with our commissioners, then uh, the other thing that we do is that um, now uh, in terms of follow-up, that one, uh, we do a lot of media work. We have a department which deals with um, dissemination of information and all that. And therefore, once we get this information, we are able um, either uh, to get um, um, uh, 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 journalists and we do a media uh, uh, briefing. Uh, sorry, let, let me plug uh, my power. Uh, sorry, sorry about that. So uh, once uh, we have this information, uh, we can uh, disseminate uh, through um, media platforms, uh, the mainstream media and also uh, social media platforms just to uh, make, um, you know, Kenyans aware of things that are happening and, you know, uh, with that different stakeholders, you know, can take up some of the, uh, of the uh, matters. The other thing is, uh, depending on uh, the weight of, um, you know, the issue that uh, we capture, then uh, we are able to uh, visit uh, the regions, the affected regions, uh, have meetings with uh, NGOs, uh, religious leaders, and specific uh, government uh, bodies. Uh, and then, uh, of course, now the other thing is now uh, either organize uh, community forums uh, and, uh, you know, in the, in the affected areas and all that. Uh, just to conclude, I would say that uh, the experience of um, the Kenya National Commission on Human Rights in terms of uh, monitoring uh, elections is that we've been able, um, you know, to contribute towards the, the escalation of our cases. If you look at, uh, you know, the statistics of uh, 2007, 1,300 uh, deaths. Uh, in 2017, we had uh, 99 uh, killings. 
2022, just uh, uh, the uh, concluded elections, we had less than 10 killings. And therefore, for me, progressively, because of you know uh, all the advisories that we do, I would say that uh, we've been able uh, you know to to help uh, in that. Then, uh, of course, we do uh, recommendations to different stakeholders. Um, you know, on issues uh, to do with the peace building terms of, um, uh, you know, protection of human rights and all that. And then uh, lastly, the, the contribution towards um, uh, rule of law in terms of regulations, um, policies, uh, change of, um, um, you know, laws and all that. And this has really, really help this country, um, you know, progressively uh, from 2002 to uh, 2022. Uh, I want to stop there. Thank you. Thanks so much, Lucas. Thanks so much. I just, I, I know we're running a little behind time, but I, I just want to make, you know, one underscore one point, which I think Lucas uh, reflected on throughout. And this is this, this role of NHRIs as, as conflict prevention mechanisms, as early warning systems. Uh, our speaker from Costa Rica, Catalina, referred to this as the thermometer or the barometer to really try and understand and, and detect grievances before they escalate uh, into conflict. So I think, you know, I commend all the work that you've done, Lucas, in your office uh, and the results you've achieved. And I think one, one other point I would make, and, and I hope we have time, I know we're running over um, to reflect on, is, is your media advocacy work and how, again, you translate the results or the, or the data that you collect and analyze and how you translate that to the relevant policymakers in order to affect policy change, because ultimately that's, you know, the, the ambition that we all share here. Um, so with that, I want to, to uh, thank all our speakers um, for sharing all their experiences and stories. Um, and I, I just want to underscore again the how these stories really uh, show the direct link between NHRIs and the sustaining uh, and the 2030 agenda, particularly SDG 16. Um, so you may remember at the beginning of the event, I, I encouraged some of the participants to share some stories about how they may have worked with or for NHRIs on, on uh, SDG 16. Uh, and indeed we have one, I think rather interesting story uh, from a participant, uh, Ahmed Barak, I hope I pronounced that correctly, a social professor at Izmir, Katip University in Turkey, uh, who has worked on research uh, and projects with the National Human Rights and Equality Institution, the Ombudsman in Turkey, and the Law Enforcement Oversight Commission, uh, looking particularly at the NHRI's monitoring function, and specifically on their oversight of law enforcement with relation or in the context of human rights violations, excessive use of force, corruption by law enforcement, etc. I, I just want to say, uh, you know, I'd love for us to have time to explore this story further, um, but I do think it's particularly interesting uh, because it underscores the, the, the focus, one of the focuses of today's event, which is namely how through oversight of the security sector, NHRIs can also act as an important conflict prevention mechanism. So uh, with that, I, I want to very quickly move to our question and answer session, and I hope our speakers can play with us for five more minutes maximum. Um, I think we have one uh, particularly interesting question, uh, which came up, I think, again and again in, in the presentations. Um, and so this is from Svenja uh, Winch Winchvich, again, I hope that's near enough, uh, advisor for international processes and agendas at the Working Group on Peace and Development. So to our speakers, she asked, what communication channels or links do our NHRIs use to communicate their findings to government and parliament? And how does this inform policy making and amendments? And just to say, we had another similar question from our audience again on how to translate your, your monitoring mediation functions into policy change. So I know we don't have much time, but perhaps we could turn to Dr. Sancho first to just briefly reflect on, on this question. Thank you, uh, Richard, and thank you for, for that question. Um, there are several ways. First, uh, we do an annual report, and then that report, it's uh, all the work that we've done, but also in that report, what we are, we've included is um, suggestions on, this is what's happening in the country, and this is what we do to Congress, and the Congress are the ones in charge of making laws. So that's one of the things, but most impo more important than that one is um, a, 
the Congress is required before passing any law that is uh, related to the work that, um, that the NHRI does, it, it's required to get criteria from the NHRI before passing that law. So we do it in two ways. We give a written criteria. So this, this is what we think, this is uh, the, the strengths of the law and this is the, the weaknesses. And yes, we agree on it or no, we can just say we're partially uh, agreeing with it or we're not and we have to say why. But we're also um, uh, sometimes required to go to uh, audio, uh, to meetings or just commissions to talk about what we think about a specific law. So we provide that technical input on it. So, uh, and if they don't ask us because sometimes there it's politics involved, so they don't wanna ask us what we think about certain issues and that's a reality, we can do it also. The law allows us to do it and send that information and make it public. So all of that goes into our into our website and it is public information. So those are the two ways that it, it, it Congress has a little bit of, you know, they have to be careful what they pass it, and, uh, and to help uh, policies. This is how, how NHRIs work. I hope that was a little bit of what um, the person was asking. Thanks so much, Kathleen. So, so I gained from that, or, or I garnered from that as well, that, that you have your functions already embedded in law. So this provides you, uh, you know, this, this legal precedent to be able to actually review, analyze, and, and attend meetings where you can um, provide recommendations or, or um, comments on, on law. Um, so I think that's, that's really a, a, clear, a clear example of how, how your work translates to policy change. And, and legal change. So with that, let me hand over perhaps to Mary um, to speak a little bit just very briefly on this on this issue. Um, about law, I guess, right? Or, or about how, how the findings of your monitoring and mediation work, how they how they actually translate it to policy change. So how do you communicate with the executive or with parliament and lobby them to take on board your findings? Yeah, uh, sorry, this was also the question um, in my chat. That's why I was. Exactly. So, uh, yeah, um, this monitoring, first of all, uh, helps not only the people who are uh, themselves uh, conflict affected, but also helps us to see the whole picture, what's going on in, uh, in the field. And uh, because all national human rights institutions, we know and have the broad mandate, we can push government. What does it mean in my case? So uh, we have a, a mandate to uh, provide our expert uh, opinion, advice to parliament uh, before adopting something. I, I mean, before adopting or drafting new framework a legal framework uh, in the field. So this helps us to, you know, to push them and say that, no, it's not like that. Uh, we are uh, doing this field of visits and we see that, for example, this is not happening like you say. So this monitoring tool is very important to use for national human rights institutions. And I really suggest you, if some of you uh, still not using it because, um, it's the best way to see what's really going on because when you are sitting in the office and you are just working on conflict affected population, it's another issue. But when you also deal with the field and uh, meet the people uh, in person, it gives you a, um, I mean, bunch of uh, opportunities to do something and to to uh, approach to government or various uh, organizations with your mandate. This is how we reflect our monitoring uh, findings afterwards. Uh, and regarding this, for example, law, not law, I mean, uh, involvement in lawmaking process, what does it mean that uh, we have a power to set a working group or just be a member of uh, governmental uh, commissions who are dealing for example, uh, from 2013, I myself uh, is involved in um, a commission which is dealing with durable housing solution, which means that uh, this is a commission which gives uh, IDPs a house. And you have a power to, uh, to say your word and to say, to whom uh, this house is needed, what kind of space and, and such kind of things. 
And uh, this lawmaking and uh, legal frameworks and this policy uh, mandate means that uh, you can provide your legal opinion and your expertise and say that this article should be like this in order to address and to, in order to respond international obligations and international requirements. Because sometimes laws need uh, to be updated because processes are changing and the law is the same. So we need to do something uh, to push government. Of course, we can't adopt a law. I mean, but we can push government to adopt better law and yeah. to make their life uh, more better. I mean, for, for affected population. Thanks so much, Mary. I see. I see again this issue of having a strong mandate enshrined in law, um, yeah. and having this as the kind of starting basis to enable you to 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 affect this oversight of, of uh, lawmaking. Let's say. Mm -hmm. um, so I know again. I apologize. We're running slightly over time, but perhaps uh, Lucas, do you want to make a quick uh, comment on on again how your work with with monitoring electoral cycles, um, how the findings of your work can inform policy. Uh, I know you spoke a little bit about media advocacy and et cetera, but the types of strategies you use, please. Uh, yes, thank you. Uh, uh, briefly, just to say that um, we have a, a good working relationship with our, um, our Kenyan uh, parliament and also the Senate. And uh, uh, what we normally do is uh, once we do our final reports, uh, we send copies uh, together the recommendations uh, to key sta uh, stakeholders. And uh, one of the uh, critical stakeholders for us is of course, parliament and, and the Senate. And we've had good uh, opportunities also. Uh, uh, we've been invited by both um, the National Assembly and the Senate uh, just to go and uh, you know make uh, presentations uh, based on uh, the work that we do. And uh, I would want to say that uh, we've gotten some very good results out of it. Uh, and two uh, quick examples that I would want to give is um, one of the things that would create tensions uh, in between voting and uh, transmission of results was uh, the long queues that uh, you know would have in the in the polling uh, stations, and therefore we, we we did a recommendation that you know we need a, a very small number uh, per you know uh, polling uh, station, and this was adopted, and therefore you would find that the tensions within the polling stations uh, you know. Uh, you, you, you know, would go low. Then uh, the other uh, quick example that I would want to give was uh, tensions would arise because uh, from the polling station to the national tallying center, you know, results, you know, at times delays and all that. And therefore, um, together with other stakeholders, we pushed, uh, you know, for a uh, um, legislation that uh, our, uh, election results at the uh, polling station, the, the lowest point of uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, you know, polling uh, process that those would be uh, legally the final results, so that whatever is taken to the national assembly, uh, not the uh, national tallying center, if it doesn't reflect what is on the ground, then uh, any uh, citizen uh, can challenge that. Thank you so much, Lucas. Again, really insightful on the types of strategies you use to to affect policy change and lobby the parliament and executive to take into account your findings and, and your work. Um, so again, I know we're running slightly over time, but we have uh, one final poll that we'd like to conduct uh, before we let you all go. And uh, the purpose of this poll was to really um, try and see if together we've come to a better understanding of, of the multiple functions that NHRIs can play uh, in preventing conflict. Um, so I'm gonna briefly read out the poll um, before my colleague posts it, because I think we only have a minute or so to, to select the right uh, answer and the question is a little bit long. So the question is, national human rights institutions are crucial actors for realizing SDG 16 and the sustaining peace agenda because A, they are a bridge between government and society. B, they are a thermometer for gauging or for identifying social tensions and can prevent those from escalating into conflict. C, their monitoring and mediation functions uh, provide access to justice, or D, all of the above. So I'd now ask my colleague Mata to please share. And again, I think we only have 30 seconds or so to answer it. So I encourage you all to answer it quickly.
Okay, sorry. So I think we have it up again. So for those who answered before, please come back and answer again. Right. Okay. Yes, now I see everyone's answering. Fantastic. I hope there is still time. Is it still active? Okay. I think it may have been because of the time only, unfortunately, some of us were only able to answer. My, my apologies for that. Uh, but it seems to be that the majority uh, chose the, let's say, correct answer, which is all of the above. Uh, and the, the point here is to underscore that the NHRIs play a variety of roles in preventing conflict. And these can directly relate and directly advance progress towards sustainable development goal 16. Uh, so from that, I, I take it that everyone is really engaged with this. Um, uh, thank you so much. Uh, just before we end, uh, there will be one final poll, which will simply ask you how you felt today's event went. Uh, but before we put that up, I just want to make one or two very brief concluding uh, remarks. So uh, I wanted to say, and I think this is very true, it's perhaps an understatement to say that we are living through turbulent times currently. Um, from the climate crisis, to the rise in authoritarianism around the world, from the effects of the COVID-19 pandemic to the devastation brought about by the war in Ukraine. While the crises we face often seem overwhelming, it's true, I, I hope and I think we should be given comfort by the fact that there are still many committed to realizing a safer, fairer and more inclusive world for all. And many of you are here today. These, uh, these dreams for a safer, fairer, and more inclusive world for all, they reflect the aspirations of SDG 16 and the Sustaining Peace Agenda. And, and I really hope that today's workshop has illustrated the, the critical role played by NHRIs uh, in achieving these dreams. So with that said, um, I just want to end uh, by briefly thanking a few people, particularly our speakers, and primarily our speakers, who are extremely busy and have taken the time to share their experiences and hopefully inspire some of our participants to move forward with, with their work. Um, I also, of course, want to thank the organizers, the Geneva Peace Building Platform, and in particular, Marta Schwartz, who has been in the background, uh, but has provided so much support uh, to make today possible. And also, of course, to our co-hosts, the Global Alliance of National Human Rights Institutions, the Carolina, for all your support and help. Uh, to my team, obviously, Alex, Alice and Pedro, uh, without whom today would not be possible. And finally, and I would say most importantly, to all our participants who have joined us today from all over the world. Um, so before you all leave, please don't all leave immediately, uh, because there'll be one final poll where you can just evaluate how you think today went. Um, so I would really encourage you to please complete that poll. Um, and I would wish you all a lovely day.